I'm going to provide just a little bit of framing uh, as we uh, as we get well moving fast um, as we get set up here. Um, you know, Peter gets referred to and referred back to a number of times. One of the interesting references yesterday was this concept of atoms and bits. And the first half of the 20th century was clearly a time of great discovery and innovation in atoms. And in the second half of the 20th century, we kind of saw bits dominate. And what's most interesting now, and I think you're going to hear from this group of panelists, is that we're actually at a time where the intersection of atoms and bits is where the greatest uh, and high impact discoveries are happening. Now to turn to another thing that was discussed yesterday. Regardless of your point of view on artificial intelligence, artificial general intelligence, applied machine learning, all of those things, and in particular applied machine learning and deep learning, are the glue, as it were, in this intersection between atoms and bits. And what we're seeing now in the world where in the land of bits we have ones and zeros, and in the land at least of biological uh, data and atoms, we have this magical combination of four letters, A, C, T, and G. And what we're finding with our understanding of DNA and the bases is that we can manipulate those both at the genetic, well, at the genetic level, at the messaging level, we, many of you probably were less familiar with RNA and mRNA, what can be done with synthetic RNA just two years ago, and are now much more familiar with the work that many researchers and companies have been focused on. And ultimately, with that code and that messaging system, if you want to kind of go down the path of information theory, as I'm sure Matt will talk about a little bit here, you ultimately produce an application arguably at the most you know, molecular level, the applications in our bodies are proteins. Proteins that are in and around cells that distinguish certain cells from other certain cells. And so we have all of these things that are happening at this intersection of bits and atoms. And in concert with that, we have fundamental discovery of what might be possible. What, it, you know, our, our understanding of biology in chemistry continues to expand in ways that um, uh, just weren't even you know, fathomable, you know, particularly at uh, a molecular level, at a nano level, as you'll hear from Jim here in just a little bit, in, in what might be, in fact, possible with technologies and discoveries like CRISPR. I don't think we'll get too much into CRISPR in this talk, but there's other mechanisms as well that are at work. And what's interesting to pull on a thread that, that George has pulled on for many years is my last sort of opening thought. We are having these fundamental discoveries concurrent with a time that we can move from an era of scarcity. The wet lab in biology was an era of scarcity, scarcity of time, scarcity of what you could iterate on and discover. And the problem with that is that chemistry and biology are essentially infinite, and now even more infinite as we learn that through genetic editing and other techniques, we can actually make almost any kind of protein, any kind of chemistry you know, possible and potentially curative. And so we've moved from an era of wet lab scarcity to automated applied machine learning and synthetic biology abundance. And I think we're right on the precipice of some really great things happening. There could be some scary things too. You can take the surveillance AI point of view and some validity to that and, and certainly apply it here. But what we're going to see today in this group of speakers is a couple of focused areas where that broader framing I just outlined come to play. And so to start, I think Steve's got a video he's going to share with us short. Yeah. and a very short introduction yeah. and then we'll move forward from there. Um, our, uh, Oscar Wilde said that nature imitates art, and what we're going to see this morning, especially in the talk just following me, is that 
uh, technology is now able to imitate and even in some ways improve upon nature. Um, major discovery in molecular and cell biology, 1970s, 1980s, we began to discover little tiny miniature machines inside cells. This is a, <clears throat> a turbine. It's called an ATP synthase. It sits in the membrane of our mitochondrial organelles within our cells. It has a rotor, um, a stator, and the little bump on that rotating drive shaft opens a pocket in the protein subunits below that creates a space of just the right size for adenosine diphosphate and inorganic phosphate to combine to make the energy-rich molecules that drive all metabolic processes in the cell. So we have turbine-generated energy production taking place on a nanoscale. And that's happening in every one of our cells right now millions of times in a lifetime, okay? Thousands of times in a second. Um, let me give you another little example of a miniature machine. Um, this has been made famous by our colleague Michael Behe at Discovery Institute. It's a rotary, it's also a rotary engine. It's the bacterial flagellar motor. It has a rotor, a drive shaft, uh, a U-joint, bushings, sits in the cell wall of a bacterium. I like to say it's high tech in low life. And the animation here shows the, uh, the, the different parts. All these parts are made of proteins but they fit together in a beautiful integrated way and they allow this, the bacterium to move through liquid. It can, this whole system is hardwired into a signal transduction system that allows the bacterium to sense changes in the sugar gradient in the liquid medium in which it resides. And it can chase down its food supply effectively. And in some species, this uh, rotary engine can change directions it rotates at 100,000 RPM and can change directions on a quarter of a turn. Now, I had, I had another one, and I hope I didn't skip over it. There's this little walking uh, robotic uh, motor proteins. They literally walk along the tubulin uh, tracks within the cell and tow large vesicles. Let's see if we, let's see if we can find that one. Maybe it, came, maybe it came after the flagellar motor. Let's see. Well, we'll have to take my word for it. It's in, uh, I have all these things animated on my website. And uh, anyway, the point is that these molecular machines are made of proteins. The proteins are made of smaller subunits called amino acids that have to be sequenced properly so that the, uh, the, the proteins will fold into the right three-dimensional configuration so they can form the parts of these nanomachines. Now, this is all relevant to our session today because a few years ago, we discovered Jim Tour's work on nanomachines that he was designing, little, uh, little cars. Oh, we got it. oh, there we go. OK, kinesin walking motor protein. People don't believe this, but this is an actual um, molecular machine at work inside our cells. It tows vesicles of materials from one place in the cell to other places where the, where the materials are needed for the construction of yet other molecular machines and systems. And it, it literally walks like that. It's, it's crazy, okay? So this is just, there's just three examples of miniature machines. There are many, many more in cells. We've got sliding clamps and a thing we've just animated called a topoisomerase, which cuts and uncuts the DNA at just the right time to, to unwind the supercoiling that occurs during DNA replication. Every uh, functional requirement of the cell is serviced by some sort of nano machine, and I'm going to hand over to Jim Tour because he's now building these things and building them in ways that can promote human flourishing and um, even attacking really nasty diseases. So, Jim. Okay. So, if you'd uh, bring up that first one. So I'll tell you some of our work that we've been, we've been working on in our group on building molecular machines. And these molecular machines are actually much smaller than the biological machines that you, you've seen just that uh, uh, were presented to you. And um, uh, each one is a single molecule. So the machines you just saw are made up of billions and billions of molecules. 
These are made up of just one molecule. Uh, so let me take you through this. So what you see here is, is our, one of our nano cars that we've made. It has four wheels because we got into this for, from, from medicine first by building nano cars. It has four wheels. These are fullerenes. Each one of these is a fullerene. You can park 50,000 of these cars across the diameter of a human hair. So that's how small they are. Uh, you can see one, you, you, you can actually see one over here, Let me, and it's moving across this surface. Uh, this is on a surface of gold and it's driving across this surface. That was the first nano collision ever recorded <laughs> um, uh, when we built this car and had it move across this surface. And then um, we entered the, the, the first international nano car race was held in 2017 in France. We entered that race and you have to locate one of your cars on a surface and then drive it around this pylon, around this pylon, and then through these two gates. And this is a 10 nanometer bar, so we went 150 nanometers in 90 minutes. Now, that may not sound very fast, but the, the next group behind us was the Swiss group, came in five hours behind us. <laughs> and no other groups in the world were able to finish in the 30 hours of the race. And so then we published a paper on how to build and race a fast nano car. And the next race is going to be in 2022. And so the competition will be much rougher. But we were not allowed to use our fastest cars because our fastest cars have motors and they wouldn't let us use those. And so that you, we build these motors in mid chassis that spin. And uh, the, the reason they spin is you, you have this atrope isomerism, and when you excite these, this will go to an orthogonal arrangement, and you have a diastereomeric transition states where this can go one way or the other, and it keeps going over the lower energy side, which causes this to rotate unidirectionally. And uh, um, so we built these into the cars, but uh, uh, we, can't, we can't use these in the race right now, but they're much faster because the motors that we're building are based on a Feringa motor and they spin about three million rotations per second. So they're very fast. And so what we did is we now took these motors without the wheels and just used the motors with certain addends that will cause it to stick to the surface of a cell. And then with that on the surface of the cell, then we turn on the motor and it will drill holes into the membrane of a cell. And in doing that, you can throw off the proton gradients and kill the cell, or you can just use a little bit of them and have analytes, have certain drugs follow in behind them. And, and uh, uh, we can watch the cells die by doing this. We first studied this by building fluorescent probes on these molecules so that we can watch them as they diffused out of an artificial lipid bilayer. And then we did something called patch clamp where you where you have them interact with cells and you watch the current of the cell increase. So as you're opening up holes, now ions can flow through and that's going to change the, the, the current that's going into and out of the cell. And you're, you're probing this with probes that are one probe inside the cell, the other outside, and you can watch these cells explode. And they explode because the ion gradients are thrown off. And, and so what we're doing here is we're working on PC3 cancer cells. This, this is a human prostate cancer cell. And what we do is we look at how fast can we kill them with the nanomachine versus controls, or how fast can we cause things like propidium iodide to diffuse into the cell and thereby kill the cell. Well, it's, what this is registering is whenever it interacts with DNA or RNA, it will intercalate and light up as red. And so this would be the way that we would introduce drugs into a certain cell by using actual nanomachines. This is not a chemical interaction. This is a mechanical interaction that is happening at the molecular scale. And because it's a mechanical interaction, it's very hard for a cell to deal with this. It's very hard for a cell to develop some resistance to this. If a cell can, can develop a resistance to a scalpel, that only then could it develop a resistance to this because this is a mechanical action, not a chemical action. And we put certain addends on the nanomachine now, and these addends are, are, uh, uh, are short peptides, uh, amino acid chains, that will recognize particular cell surfaces. And when they recognize the cell surface that, that you want, you have a, a particular cancer cell type, you can assay it, say, 
what, what, uh, what is overexpressed on the surface, you target that particular cell type and then have it go to that cell and kill the cell. We can even drill through skin. So this is one of our fast nanomachines <clears throat> where you can see how it's drilled down into the skin of this mouse versus the slow or just the solvent. And we can actually start drilling into the skin because what we'd like to do is, is start looking at melanoma, for example. Can we treat it in this way? Uh, we've developed other nanomachines that respond to two-photon near-IR light. Two-photon is inherently confocal, meaning that it's a very sharp beam so that we can shoot over one cell. So both of these cells have nanomachines on their surface, but we can fire right across over the top of one cell and hit another cell, and that cell dies. That's because propidium iodide has filled that cell, and so we know it's dead. This cell is very much alive, and you see this blebbing where the cell is undergoing what's called necrosis. It just explodes. Normally, cells like to die by apoptosis, where they undergo a programmed cell death, and they start chopping up their DNA uh, before they release it. They'll chop up a lot of their peptides before they release it. But since we can cause the cells to just explode, they dump out their information, and now you can couple this with immunotherapy. This is an <clears throat> another way. What we did, we have three different cell types here. We have MCF7, which is a, there's, it, it's a breast cancer cell line, a prostate cell line, and a third cell line. And we can put all three of these in the same dish. Target one, and it doesn't kill the other two. Target the second, doesn't kill the first and the third. Target the third, and it doesn't kill the first and the second. We have that sort of precision by putting the proper peptides on that will recognize just the specific cell of choice. The nanomachines will go to that cell, stick there, and then boom, we turn them on and they drill through and kill that cell. Uh, what we've done is we've started a collaboration now with MD Anderson. We started a company around this called Nanorobotics. One of my former postdocs uh, uh, is with that company now. And he's gone through actually the Discovery Institute program for one summer. He was, he was part of that. Um, and so when you look at, at, at uh, squamous cell and basal cell and, and melanocyte carcinomas, you can have the squamous cell carcinoma, which doesn't go very deep. Many, many people here may have had these cut off by dermatologists. The basal cell goes a little bit deeper. The melanoma can go very deep, and that's where it starts hitting the, the lymph system, and that's when it becomes really serious, where it spreads out. So can we start using the nanomachines where we just apply them here, shine a light, and have them go in and destroy these different cells that are on the surface? And we can look at all of these different cell types, and once you have the nanomachines, this is 100% viability. Only when you have the nanomachines with light, boom, they just kill, 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 kill. Everything dies. Very quickly, they cause cell death. Uh, you can have cells in a dish. You, you, uh, when, once you shine the light with the molecular nanomachines, everything dies. Everything dies. So, so it's very, they're very good at, at going to a particular cell and just killing. And uh, uh, we've gone to in vivo models where we, we have these mice where they'll be injected with a tumor cell line. It'll grow. And then you inject the nanomachines and shine the light, and you watch the tumor growth subside. The tumor goes away. The problem with this is we're using, we were first using ultraviolet light. Then we designed the nanomachines to work with visible light. But still, visible light doesn't have deep enough penetration through human flesh. What we'd like to do is use near IR light. The problem with near IR light is it's much lower energy. Maybe when you were a kid, you might have, you put your, your hand up to a, a, a lamp shade and it looks red and you say, oh, there's the blood in there. That's not the blood. What's happening is the near IR light is going through. So, so you're getting the infrared light and it appears red because it's the only light that gets through. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to redesign them and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But uh, we've coupling this also with immunotherapy because the idea is these cells die so quickly they spew out their proteins, and you can activate now the immune system to go after those proteins. So that's what we're using, because maybe the nanomachines didn't find some of the cells in the body, but now when you've activated the immune system to that particular cell type, then you allow the immune system to start going after those cells. So that's one of the things we're working toward. The other thing that we're working on is, is killing super bacteria. 
Now, the financial people around tell me there's no money in, in, in making antibiotics. That's okay. We're in academics. We're going to kill these things because it's going to wipe out humankind if we don't deal with it. Uh, uh, there are these superbugs that are supposed to kill 10 million a year by the year 2050. So what I tell students is that when you are my age, it's going to look, COVID's going to look like a walk in the park. Uh, if you give MRSA in, the, in a hospital right now, MRSA, I mean, it's, it's very hard to kill these things. And so there are nightmare bacteria on Earth today that we don't know how to deal with. Very, very deadly. Can't control them. Uh, and then what happens is you can have a bunch of bacteria, and then there happens to be one bacterium among them that is genetically resistant to your antibiotic. Then you go through a normal antibiotic regime, it knocks out all of these except the one that happens to be genetically resistant. And then that one that's genetically resistant starts multiplying, and all of a sudden you have a genetically resistant strain really hard to kill. That's why this is a big, big problem. It just happens to be resistant genetically, and then it starts, and what bacteria can do is they share DNA with each other. So you get a, and, and so it can even take bacteria that are not genetically resistant and they'll share their DNA with it, so now they become genetically resistant. So these are really sinister little creatures. There's a problem here is that there's a 35-year gap. Every FDA-approved antibiotic used today is based on a scientific discovery from 1984 or, or earlier. And you say, why is that? Because there's no money in this. Because as soon as you develop a new drug, Within about five years, they've built up a resistance to it, and the drug companies have not accrued back their money yet. So it's a big problem. Uh, and then when you look at bacteria, it doesn't just have a cell membrane. This is a gram-negative bacterium. You would have a, a membrane, then you have a peptidoglycan, which is an extra layer, and then another cell membrane, another membrane. So bacteria are really hard to kill versus like, like a human cell that would just have the one membrane. And, and this is a very difficult layer to get through. So can the nanomachines really drill through this? And so here is a bacterium. This is a super bacterium. It has just destroyed the cell wall here. It's called a cell wall, not even a membrane, but a wall. And they drill right through, and they just, they just uh, make jello out of the innards of this thing. They go in, and then what we found that we can do is we can just take a small amount of this and put it with outdated antibiotics which the cells normally don't respond to because they can no longer get through the cell membrane anymore. And we can take it with outdated antibiotics and turn the antibiotics back on. And uh, now they go flowing in. So we can drill some holes, let the antibiotics go in, or just use more nanomachine and just kill the cell by itself. The molecular nanomachines have exponential cell death. Uh, this is novobiosin. These are traditional antibiotics that are used today, and it shows how ineffective they are. These cell counts are not dying. We put in some of our nanomachines. These are logarithmic decreases. So this is a five log reduction in four minutes of just knocking out these cells. This is, this is exponential death of the cells of these bacteria. These are super bacteria we're testing against. We also uh, go after what are called these persister cells, these cells that don't normally die. All of the traditional antibiotics are not touching these. Our nanomachines, we have different nanomachines that can kill these exponential death. I mean, just, just large amounts. Of these. these are log reduction in bacterial death. The bacterium cannot build a resistance to this because it's a mechanical effect. It's like drilling a hole in it. It's not a chemical effect. They also destroy biofilms. Biofilms are really a, a real problem. If you have anything artificial inserted in your body, there are biofilms accumulating. And in those biofilms, bacteria are exchanging DNA material between them. Very hard to get through these. We can chop right into the biofilms. Um, we've gone after these highly resistant ones where we find the ones that are resistant. We just multiply the ones that are resistant. And then we, we treat these with the normal drugs, uh, tetracycline, germacin, it, and nothing is stopping these. They just continue to grow. We're baseline. Nothing is growing in these, not even this. These are our baselines right here. Everything is killing these. So even these persister cells, these bacteria, these can drill into them. Um, 
This is, this is what E. coli looks like. This is a normal E. coli. You can see it's undergo they're, where they're even undergoing cell division. This is what E. coli looks like after it's been exposed to the nanomachines. It's just filled with holes all over it. Very, very uncomfortable for these cells. They die quite rapidly. Why don't um, we give Matt a chance to outline some of his things, and I think we'll kind of circle uh, back here. Am, right? I, am I done? No, can, no, not can, done. Can, can, I, can I get to the conclusion? Can get to the conclusions, and then we'll, uh, oh, then we'll okay, get Matt okay. a shot to introduce, right. and then we'll have a discussion. Okay, and, and so we disrupt these, the, these biofilms this way. But now what we're doing is we're going to these next generations that are going to be near IR active, because if you can go 10 centimeters, 10 to 13 centimeters death pen penetration, you can hit any spot on a typical human body. You can just, just uh, uh, the light is from the outside, just goes right on in, and we, total, we had to do a total redesign of the molecules, and these are more jackhammer-like. Uh, but but uh, I think we're going to be successful in doing the same thing. So with that, this is a mechanical action, and I'll just wrap it up here. There's a company around this, and here's the folks that have done this. Um, everybody with a star, the different folks working in this, and uh, um, uh, this has been funded by the Discovery Institute. Had it not been for the Discovery Institute, this project would have died. You think, oh, NIH would love to fund this. Very hard to get funding for this type of thing. And uh, they kept it alive, and now we're getting more funding, and it's working out quite well. Okay, thank you. I, I hope Jim has sufficiently stretched your minds. We want to introduce um, Matt as well, and then we'll circle back whether we want to focus more on some of the oncology-oriented use cases here, and that's, I think, an area that Matt's going to focus on, or if you want to think about these, these micro-machines, these molecular, you know, machines as it relates to things like the bacteria topic that Jim also introduced. But let's have Matt share a little bit about what he's working on. Yeah. All right. So yeah, my, uh, my name is uh, Matt Schultz. I'm the CEO of Oshin Biotechnologies. And I'm going to uh, make an effort to bridge a couple of these uh, topics that have been discussed throughout the event, moving from uh, you know, the bits to the atoms, basically. And I think in, in some respects, uh, life is the original bridge between atoms and bits. Um, and in fact, I got into this world uh, with the kind of North Star that the essence of life is information. And it's not to say that, uh, you know, you can't, where you haven't had some mileage, say, uh, manipulating life with chemistry. Um, we, we certainly have. I mean, most of the, the history of medicine has been, you know, plants and prayers, effectively. But, uh, but it's also why most drugs have a list of side effects that are longer than the, the benefits. And, uh, and so what had actually got me into this initially were vaccines and this uh, idea of immune memory. And you know, people would pay lip service to this a, a bunch, but I, I mean, if you got a vaccine, a, a disease that used to kill you wouldn't even give you the sniffles. And this was interesting in that you know, nothing has changed fundamentally about the host or the pathogen. It's just you know, memory. And being you know, the computer scientist, I want to know, well, where does that file live? Where's the hard drive? You know, what language is this encoded in? And, uh, and it led me down this journey into the adaptive immune system. And, uh, and then I got really thinking about uh, diseases you can't vaccinate against. Take, you know, like HIV. And HIV is an interesting case. Now we've got, you know, 30 million dead people. Each one made countless trillions of antibodies in a vain attempt to neutralize the virus before succumbing to it. And, but a, a handful of those people built uh, antibodies that could protect them. They bound to the virus in a place it couldn't change. And they either didn't get sick or got sick very slowly. And what's interesting is uh, we know those sequences now. We, we have the key, if you will. It's been pulled from the, the arms of survivors in Africa. But uh, what we did to, to get those was effectively a brute force attack with flesh and blood against this, you know, 100 nanometer ball of protein in RNA. And so I got thinking, could, could we leverage the computational power of the planet to fight this battle instead? Could, could we use silicon instead of souls to wage war against viruses? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got into the world of biotech trying to port protein docking algorithms to cryptographic hardware, to use password crackers to evolve the immune system in silico. And as I was kind of moving down that path, uh, someone pointed out that cells don't have USB ports. And <laughs> I don't think they meant that to be constructive criticism, uh, but uh, um, it, it was, it, it kind of shocked me. And genuinely, I was like, 
this, I guess, is the pros and cons about coming into a new field. It's like people have wanted to monkey with DNA ever since they knew what the double helix was. How is it that all these years later, we don't have a good way of doing it? And so basically set out uh, to build uh, went into an app store for the human body. And this is uh, my first uh, biotech company, Inusoft. And what we would do is we would take out uh, B cells, lymphocytes that made antibodies, and we would basically modify them in a dish and mature them into a plasma cell that made whatever we wanted. And a fully mature plasma cell is one of the most prolific secretory cells in the body. It can produce around 10,000 antibodies every second. And you've got like 10 to the ninth of these things. Like uh, it, it is parallel processing on an almost unimaginable scale. And uh, I, so I wanted to be able to manipulate them. Uh, the problem is that they don't want to be manipulated. And so uh, it, <laughs> it led to you know, scouring the globe looking for technologies that could get this you know, information into the cell. And it eventually led me to uh, Caltech, uh, to the lab of uh, David Baltimore, and uh, ENS Leon. And we managed to get these uh, culture system from the Baltimore lab and this new kind of viral vector uh, out of France. And what we basically did, uh, it sounds a little nefarious, especially in the context of today, but uh, we put the, the shell of measles on the core of HIV. And because uh, B cells are very uh, resistant to modification with HIV, and, uh, and measles is very infectious. And I know this sounds scary, but it couldn't copy itself. And uh, as a bit of poetic justice, we uh, gave it instructions for uh, killing HIV. And so we were able to basically uh, hijack the adaptive immune system to make therapeutic proteins. And we began to make things like lysosomal enzymes and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, but uh, this... Uh, my real interest in doing all this uh, kind of ties to aging. And you know, something is probably apparent to everyone if you think about it, but you can never you know, shovel enough pills down your throat to undo aging. Like, uh, there, it's, a, it's a battle we can't win. And, but if you can manipulate the code of life, you can do all sorts of things that you never could before. I mean, you could, in theory, my goal at the time was to recreate the biochemical environment of youth as you aged. And, uh, and I wanted to go after aging specifically because aging is like the master corollary for pretty much any malady you can think of. I mean, you have worse odds right now of having you know, cancer as a clean living 70 year old than you do a chain smoking 20 year old. And it's not to say that your ill spent youth isn't going to haunt you later, uh, but uh, that age itself is this dominant risk factor. And so we wanted to go out and tackle it itself. And, we, uh, we took this same thesis about like manipulating information in the body, and instead of now trying to change things outside the body, we want to manipulate things inside. And the problem is uh, the body really has a vested interest in not letting you monkey with its DNA. And, uh, and so people have attempted to do this with things like viruses, and probably the most common tool. They're, after all, purpose-built machines to do just that. Um, but uh, they have lots of issues. Your body doesn't like them, and they're expensive to make. And so building aging treatments that cost a million bucks a dose is not very scalable. And what we ended up doing was uh, building something called this uh, proteolipid vehicle. It's basically a fat bubble, about the size of a virus. Um, but uh, it has a little protein on the surface. And I don't have enough time to go into what that thing is, but it has kind of a fun story in that it was taken initially from a, a reptilian rail virus, this thing that normally infects the stomachs of alligators and birds. And it has a couple interesting pro properties about it. It's actually the only fusogenic virus that's not enveloped. And uh, that little fusion protein is about 100 times smaller than, say, like the spike on, on COVID or measles or flu. And uh, at size, gives it some really interesting advantages. It's effectively invisible to the immune system. It burrows itself there into that lipid bilayer. But, uh, but the way it works is kind of what bridges uh, you know, this talk that uh, Jim had just done with uh, earlier information. And, that is, when uh, that particle gets close to a cell, it forms a complex and it flips. It basically mixes the lipid of the particle with the lipid of the cell. And uh, so it, it's using, in this case, you know, the atoms to deliver information. And this is uh, important because it doesn't have any specificity for any kind of cell. There's no receptor-mediated uh, interactions. There's no endocytosis. It just disrupts the membrane and drops its payload directly inside. And this allows you to do some pretty cool things. Going back to our app store of the human body, um, I don't know if you're familiar with this particular cow. It's a Belgian blue cow. It's a naturally occurring mutant that's about double the muscle mass of a normal cow. Um, it lacks a molecule called myostatin, which is a break on uh, muscle development. So if you take it away, it's about double the size. And people have made these things in mice. Uh, they're, uh, 
see the middle mouse is a, an equivalent mutation. But uh, you can actually push it a little further, and then instead of just getting rid of the break on muscle development, you can drive muscle development. And uh, so we make something called follistatin. Follistatin is kind of the pathway for skeletal muscle exercise. It basically, uh, it's what's released when your muscles are damaged. It tells you, environment's hurting you, get stronger. You know, being the I guess, lazy scientist I am, I'm like, what if you made it 24 seven? Then uh, you wouldn't have to work out. <laughs> It'd be awesome. And, uh, um, and it turns out that uh, if you do this with our technology, th those things, remember the first ones, uh, they're like that from birth, so they get really big. If you do this uh, later in life with just a, a, a treatment like ours that you can do practically today, uh, the mouse gets about 50% larger and twice as strong in less than a year. And so th this mouse is not put in the gym. It, um, and that, that is not nearly as striking, admittedly, as you know, super mouse over there. But consider for a moment that I weigh about 200 pounds. If you add 50% of my body mass to me, I'm a 300 pound guy. Like, it, it's huge. Uh, I mean, it, twice the strength. And uh, other than you know, making athletics a bit more interesting, I think there are, are viable things to do with this. And, <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, in aging in particular, physical strength is everything. Like, it's the difference between a walker or a wheelchair or walking versus running. Like, I mean, it, it's a huge, huge deal, physical frailty. And so now we have the ability to manipulate information in life, and we can tell it gets strong when you're old. And that's a, that's a big step forward. But uh, you can also do some other really interesting things with it. And uh, we set about, in this case, instead of trying to build things and alter the behavior of cells, uh, to try to kill them. And, uh, and it was based on an idea that might seem odd, but a cancerous cell knows it's cancerous. And uh, you think of the complex control logic in every cell in your body. Like, how does a neuron know to be a neuron and not a skin cell or a muscle cell? And, uh, and by the time like, a cell becomes cancerous, you had all these things that failed, from DNA repair pathways, tumor suppressors, you know, immune surveillance. It's in a very unnatural state. And uh, so we can take advantage of that transcriptional behavior. And so we wrote a program in DNA that basically says, if you're cancerous, kill yourself. And in this slide right here, uh, we're using that same kind of logic, but instead of killing it, we're saying make a firefly protein, luciferous, and it makes the fireflies glow. So we inject that IV into the mouse. And, uh, on the left uh, is just our, our control. So we say, make it in every cell. There's no real complicated logic, just turn on. And you can see the whole mouse lights up, and its organs light up if you look at them. But on the right there is the more interesting one. In that case, it's under that cancer logic again. And there's a tumor implanted in that uh, flank in the red dashed line. But, uh, but all those tissues got the exact same dose, same route of administration. We injected this IV. It's, all that DNA is everywhere, but it's only turning on now in the tumor. So what we've effectively been able to do is take targeting out of the realm of chemistry and bring it into the realm of information. And that, that's pretty amazing if you think about it. Because, I mean, right now, like, you can write a genetic program on your iPhone, and it'll show up in the mail in a FedEx envelope. Like, we can write programs in the language of life things that are far more complex than chemistry. And, uh, and so this is, uh, opens up opportunities to all sorts of amazing stuff. And of course, if you're looking at aging and perhaps a little vanity, I suppose, we uh, built one that targets fat. And uh, so this is a suicide gene therapy for fat cells. It, uh, it will leave all cells untouched and uh, just kill fat cells. And in that case, you have a it's called OBOB mouse, bred to be obese, um, and it's massive, as you can see. Um, in the early prototypes of these were transgenic, they could activate it, and within three days, there won't be a viable fat cell left in the animal. And uh, um, so we obviously don't want to do that for people. But uh, the, <laughs> you need some fat, um, <laughs> although it's actually relatively easy to control. So we can target, say, visceral fat versus you know, subcutaneous fat selectively. And uh, it, our plan for this actually is to start out with local administration for rare genetic lipidemias, um, where you get you know, abnormal depositions of fat. And, uh, but you know, if you think about it on, on just the lens of aging, you know, obesity is a huge killer. This is going after metabolic disease, basically. It's kind of a holy grail in, in aging medicine. Okay, so I'll stop there because I know we're running a little bit over. I promised your minds were going to be stretched. Um, I, I wanted to ask one question to Jim and then we may have time for one question from the audience for the group, but, but, but Jim, we had this whole area of micro-machines, there's a mechanical dimension of them, you then reference things like prostate uh, cancer as an area that you've bridged from the micro-machines into something that could be therapeutic. 
how are you, how are you partnering you know with your lab and then in some cases other labs to actually bridge that world between the micro machines and the applications in this case of uh, potentially curative approaches to cancers like prostate cancer okay so so we we take our nano machines we put them in the hands of a person who goes to across the street to MD Anderson Cancer Center and he works with the folks there where they inject tumor cell lines into the flank of a mouse we uh, inject a, let that grow for a while, inject small amounts of these nanomachines in there and just shine a light and do controls where we inject nanomachines that, that have very slow rotators, maybe two revolutions per hour. So they're very similar, just a very small change as controls. Same with bladder cancer where you inject them into the bladder. Uh, now, and, and, and so it, it, it uses all the tools that, that are normally used in cancer research and uh, uh, we're just applying the nanomachines and shining a light. So it, it's th that, that's not the hard part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Open it up to any questions. I could ask questions all day of this group, but. Um... A simple question. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> the question was, what could possibly go wrong? You must be talking about. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Jamie, you want to take this? <laughs> so, I mean, with the net. With the nanomachines, you don't turn on the light and nothing goes wrong. And after a few hours, these, these, uh, these molecules are, are, are uh, uh, expelled by the body anyway. But, but um, uh, it takes intense light. It's not like you walk out in the sun and these things start activating. It takes a, the, the, the UV and the visible ones take a pretty intense light. The near IR is not going to be as intense, but, it, it, but it's going to be a, at a specific wavelength and you put that light very close to the source. So, so uh, uh, and then within a few hours, it's, it's gone away. So in many ways, it's actually, it's actually more protective because you don't get any off-target activation, only where the molecules are <clears throat> and where you shine the light. So it's got a, a, a dual targeting safety mechanism. Is that the hard part? Is that the hard part? Um, uh, no, no, the, the hardest part is trying to design the molecules right that will work with light of a particular wavelength such that they can still drill through the, the, the cells. That's, that's the hardest part, it's the molecular design. The, the tools of biology are very good. I, I wanted to say something about what the elegant part of this was, which was what a, a, attracted us to this. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I think what the really elegant part of this is the uh, synthesis of the techniques of organic chemistry. Jim is an organic chemist as well as a nanomachine engineer. And he's designed the nanomachines, but using the, the tricks of organic chemistry, he's able to get them to bind selectively to, for example, the malignant cancer cells without binding to the surrounding healthy tissue. And that's been a holy grail in cancer research of all different kinds. How do you kill the, the malignancy without uh, damaging the healthy surrounding tissue. So this is, I think, another really elegant aspect of what you're doing. And, and we're going to let Matt have the last word on what could possibly okay. go wrong. <laughs> well, it, it's limited only by your imagination, for better or worse, I suppose. <laughs> um, but the, uh, for, for these therapeutics, there's a, a couple things that really work in our favor. Is that one is we can control the duration of expression. So you can have DNA that express, or even RNA that express for a, a short time and go away. Uh, the other, though, is that when we're killing cells, for example, we use an inducible suicide gene primarily. So our, our preferred way of killing things for aging is apoptosis because we don't want the, the necrotic mess that uh, Jim was seeking. But in cancer, actually, we do try to make a bigger mess um, for immunotherapeutic purposes. The, uh, but we induce these with a second drug, typically. And so they don't just turn on on their own. Like, you have to deliver this, and then you activate it separately. And I think that, that provides another margin of safety for it. But the, the beauty, really, is if you realize there's an off-target effect for something, say, like, it, we thought we are after cell X, and we're also getting cell Y. In chemistry, it might be very difficult to re-engineer that to get rid of it. But uh, in the world of information, it's relatively straightforward. You can have like interfering RNAs or combinations of promoters and repressors. And so I can build a new one of those in two weeks. And this gives us a great deal of flexibility as we build these things out. Well, that gave us all a lot to think about. There are risks, obviously, and there are incredible opportunities as well at this intersection of bits and atoms. So I want to thank Jim, Matt, Steve for their perspective here.